Global is an early stage venture capital firm that focuses on deep tech. We're proud to support transformative companies like FarmWise and Robust AI that are poised to create multi-generational impact. Our portfolio is unique and special, but so is the building we work from. We can't be there today, unfortunately. I did display it behind me. But Playground is a 70,000 square foot facility with various labs and a community that's always excited to engage on topics like this one. So at some point in the future, when it becomes possible again, I hope that we'll be able to host a robo chat there and uh, host all of you. So with no further ado, let me introduce our moderator, Sasha Ostoyich, who is an operating partner at Playground and the mastermind behind these robo chats. For those of you who don't know him, he's had a legendary career leading engineering for companies like NVIDIA and Cruise Automation. He advises companies in our portfolio on engineering, uh, technology, product development, network expansion, and sits on the advisory boards for Zeus, Zooks, which is now Amazon, uh, Samsung Electronics, and others. So again, thank you so much to everyone for joining us today for this timely conversation, and please join me in welcoming Sasha. Hey, Allison, thank you for that intro and the kind words. All right, for those who are new to RoboChats, let me just say that the RoboChat series is a platform for leading experts and really nice people, as you will see today, uh, in the fields of robotics, AI, and the future of computing to discuss and present cutting edge ideas, trends, challenges, insights, and so forth. Uh, this is true to our mission at Playground Global to uncover and invest in technologies that will have a multi-generational impact and are somewhere on the scale between improbable and impossible. We like hard technology problems, and we will discuss some of those today. All right, so the quickly uh, housekeeping, the format today will be <clears throat> speaker one, Q&A, speaker two, Q&A. Speaker one will stick around for the Q&A at the very end as well, uh, so to make sure we address as many questions as we can from our audience. All right, um, our first speaker, Seb Boyer, is one of those brilliant young individuals who went straight from school after getting two master's degree out of MIT, one in computer science, one in technology policy. And I think that technology policy is truly important in becoming a CEO in an industry that has regulation, implications on the labor market, on climate change and so forth. Um, and he is working with engineers and farmers to define the future of farming. Seb, thanks a lot for joining us today. Thanks for having me, pleasure to be here. All right, so before we dive into impact of COVID on automation and your business and wider, um, tell us what drove you and your co-founder Thomas to address automation in farming and you know, what, are, what are the challenges you actually wanted to solve for the world? Yeah, thanks, thanks for giving me the opportunity to, to be here and, and speak about what we do today. So we started about three and a half years ago. Um, the, initially, the motivation was really around sustainability and how do we make the world more sustainable? What are the biggest contributors to climate change and the impact that we have as, um, as a species on, on the environment? And farming is obviously a big, big contributor on both of those um, dimensions. That was the initial angle. Um, and that's what pushed us to start spending more time with farmers. And what we quickly realized when we started to do that was that not only were they um, seeing a lot of pressure to change their practices because of these trends and because of consumers on one hand, regulators on the other hand, pre putting pressure on them to change those, these practices, but also they are facing a major problem today around availability of labor. And we were extremely surprised when we started to spend more time in the field to realize how um, how reliant we still are on very tedious, hard tasks that are performed with um, both hands on the field today. So that's when we started to um, uh, build, like, started to engage with, with farmers to define technologies that will truly help them on both fronts, being more efficient with chemicals on one side and um, help alleviate some of the most tedious tasks that they need to perform on the other side. These are really the two motivations behind behind what we do. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, uh, farming is one of those dull, dirty, sometimes dangerous jobs that are ripe for automation and and given the labor implications that, as you discussed. All right. So we are in a, in unprecedented times with the pandemic with COVID nineteen. So how has this new reality impacted your operations, demand for your service? 
priorities, you know, what happened since February with your yeah, business? Um, yeah, a lot happened. And we, um, I would say like funny thing was that at the very beginning uh, of um, the COVID crisis, like let's say like end of February, the beginning of March, we kind of assumed that we will be, we, we won't be impacted. Like we're, after all, like we're um, in the farming industry, people would eat food, everything will stay the same. Obviously that proved not to be true very uh, quickly after that. And so we, we saw kind of two types of impacts, one good, one bad, on the, let's start with the, the worst side. Um, tremendous uh, um, impact on the supply chain. So we build uh, machines, build these, these type of machines here. Um, heavy machines we are uh, mostly relying on domestic supply chain which was pretty good um we still saw some of the sensors some of the components um, ab abroad overseas so we saw a big disruption in the supply chain very early on uh basically our, our manufacturing line that was producing some of these machines basically stopped from one day to the next and stayed closed for about a month, month and a half for, for some of our suppliers. So that had a big impact and like big, um, uh, uh, that was a big change for us. We had to kind of readapt, increase utilization of existing machines and so on. And then on, on the other side, um, on, on the field side, it was kind of the opposite. And we, we saw how hard it is to be um, relaying on, on manual work to grow, harvest and weed the, the food that we eat every day and farmers were really struggling to put in place all of their safety practices that we all had to put in place. Um, and that put a lot of pressure on them when it comes to um, efficient operations on the field. So we saw like a short term concern around um, manual work that really pushed their demand for, for, for our service. And then starting like later on, when we started to have more open discussions with, with our customers, we quickly realized that that also made them think a lot about where they want to be in the future and like how fast they want to um, be adopting those, these technologies. So I think there is also like a longer term um, wave that is kind of positive for, for automation uh, in general, particularly in farming. Right. Um, so what aspect of automation do you specifically address in farming? So yeah, so we're starting with a specific process. What we do today is we cut weeds, essentially. So cutting weeds or killing weeds in general is a critical process across the farming industry. Many weeds compete with crops for everything from water, sunlight, soil nutrients. So we come in and we offer a, an alternative to herbicides or manual work when it comes to killing the weeds. The way we're doing it is we uh, design and build these machines here. And they're using computer vision and robotics to locate the weeds in the 3D space and then move robotic arms um, with basically 12 robotic arms with different degrees of freedom to very precisely go around each crop and cut out the weeds. So the process we leverage is very similar to using basic tools that like if you and I do the weeding in our garden, like we're gonna use hose, like very basic tools we basically mimic this and automate the process of doing that at scale uh, on commercial fields. So chemi chemical-free, labor-free weeding. Yeah, in a nutshell, that's it. So what are some of the challenges in being, being able to do that? Yeah, um, so there are several types of challenges. There are uh, technical challenges and then there are more like operational challenges. Uh, on the technical side, you want precision and speed and you want both of them a lot. And that always comes at like a, uh, it always comes as a challenge, I think. Um, so we want to do a very good job of cutting out the weeds very precisely around each crop without hurting the crop. Pretty much again, like what people do when they get, when they're weeding their field, where they're weeding their garden. Um, but we also wanted to do it very efficiently so we can be cost effective, we can create value for farmers. So we need to run our machines at a certain speed. So getting that precision um, is, is very challenging technically. You have to get the right sensors obviously, but then the right like algorithms that run uh, fast enough so that you don't have, um, like you can actually go through the fields um, very efficiently. So 
a lot of technical challenges to reach that precision and quality that you want on the field. Then you have more like kind of operational challenges. Um, how do you work closely with farmers to uh, integrate seamlessly within their existing workflows without asking them to change much of their behavior? Uh, and that's something we took into account very early on because we build our products in partnership with with um, a couple of farmers in California. But that was always something top of mind and still something that we put a lot of efforts thinking about. How do we reduce the time it takes to complete a field so we can um, we can fit easy, um, more easily into their existing workflows? Uh, how do we work and communicate with them? Uh, so we're building kind of technologies that allow us to do that more and more efficiently. Uh, but that's a big and I think very critical aspect of the type of automation that we're bringing, the operational and it, uh, in integration aspect of it. All right. Well, actually, Alan Miller happened to ask uh, along these lines on technical challenges. You know, what are some, some specific perception or sensing challenges that you have to deal with and how do you address them? So, and I can elaborate a little more on that. I've been to the farm. I've seen your machines operate. You have a strobe light, um, you have multiple cameras, but, you know, uh, they're not perfect. So what is the criteria there? Yeah. Um, so one of the big challenges early on that we recognized was uh, the lighting conditions. Lighting is, in computer vision, lighting play a, play a big role. Um, and so on the field, like obviously by default, you don't control the, the lighting. Uh, I guess God, God does. So we choose to kind of enclose our system, use strobe lights and shades to control as much as possible the lighting conditions. And we're doing uh, a good job at it right now. So we have consistent lighting conditions across a single field, but also across different fields, which essentially allow us to reuse data from one field to inform the algorithms that are going to be used on other fields. That's really critical. Um, then you obviously get, like you, you need to get the right sensors, uh, you need to get the right um, CNN structure, so that you run these algorithms both, um, again, like accurately, but also quickly. Um, so we have embedded compute on the, on the, on the machines uh, and we size these computers to be able to run these algorithms quickly on the field. So basically right now it takes us less than a second between the time we capture the image and the time we act on the crop. Uh, and that's what we need to be at in order to perform at the efficiency we, we want. All right. Um, so what's the future of all this? You know, okay, you're doing weeding now in five years, are uh, robots deliver picking, triaging and delivering tomatoes to my house. Yeah, well, um, yeah, we'll see which part of that we, we actually do. For us, like the big picture is kind of going back to the beginning of the big trends. Um, the big picture is that today, you look at the crops that you and I eat every day, um, about 50% of that cost of growing like vegetables and fruits is manual work. About 50% um, about, uh, of what's left, so 25% is chemicals, uh, whether fungicides, insecticides, um, or herbicides. So about 75% is either labor or chemicals. And we know that, and farmers know that both of these inputs are not going to be sustainable in a broad sense of the term. It's not sustainable for the environment. It's not even sustainable economically for them to continue to rely on, on, on these things. So that's kind of the size of the overall opportunity. Then our approach is to break down these costs into the different processes that are critical to grow food on the field and kind of address them one by one. So we started with the, the, the weeding process for a very various reasons that we probably don't have time to go into today. But we see very similar opportunities, uh, automating harvesting, automating um, uh, crop protection, so fungicides and, and insecticides. Uh, because in both of those areas, you have processes that basically dates back to the 70s uh, and, so, and that are very inefficient. All right, uh, I don't think we have a lot more time, but here's one last question from Lalita Vish. Actually, it's multiple questions here, so let's see. Um, at industry level, can farmwise machines work anywhere in the world, soil, weather, cropping conditions? Um, so I would love to say yes. Uh, I think the reality is a little bit more nuanced. We design our machines to be quite general in terms of crops, for instance. So the only thing we need to do to change from one vegetable type to the next 
is to capture images, train algorithms. Uh, so that's kind of a software update. Um, that being said, like we've also had to design it in a particular form factor, the form factor that you're seeing here, which allows us to work on most vegetable crops, but not on trees, for instance. So we don't do apples uh, today, at least. So the particular machine you see here work on low, um, low row crops. So that's in terms of crops, in terms of geographies, the geography doesn't really matter uh, in terms of like not technically matters because a lot of farmers in the world have adopted practices that are, they're not the same, but they're similar enough so that we can kind of adjust the technology quite easily. Um, we're doing work in two states in the US right now, uh, California and Arizona, and we see some differences, but nothing major. We also are in touch with some growers in Europe that have very similar problems. So yeah, I think with minor changes, the technology can be adapted uh, throughout the world. Then it's boils down to the unit economics and what other particular trends around chemicals and particular trends around availability of labor in those countries and how does that translate into um, a, a business case for farmers to use our technology in the short term. I think in the long term, yes, we'll see adoption in many, many countries. Okay. So is any of the lettuce we get today out of California weeded by farmwise? Most likely. Uh, I didn't okay. run the numbers recently, uh, but cauliflower, lettuce, uh, these that if you live, for those of you who live in, in California, um, there, is a, there is a good chance. All right. Hey, Seb, thanks so much. Uh, this was oh, very insightful. And please hang around in case there are other more questions uh, after our next speaker. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. All right. Take care. All right, moving on. Anthony Jules, a uh, seasoned executive um, with an extensive history of building companies, running successful teams, um, worked at Activision, uh, Google X, multiple robotics projects, and now chief operating officer and co-founder of Robust AI, which uh, hopes to address the problem of how narrow AI currently is in being able to solve problems and Robust wants to build a industrial grade cognitive platform for robots, basically robots that can learn and figure things out on their own rather than requiring, you know, the amount of energy for a small village to train a model kind of thing. All right, Anthony. There we go. All right. Hi, Sasha. Yeah, thank, uh, thank, thank you for having me, Sasha. Absolutely. Hey, given your extensive experience in the field, uh, what are some of your key learnings and insights on the business of robotics? Um, so th I, I guess I'll start with, with talking about what the business of robotics is. Um, firstly, I think it, it may be surprising to people who aren't in the industry uh, how small the industry is. Um, you know, robotics as an industry, if you're, very, um, if you're very generous, is about a $60 billion a year industry um, globally. And to give everyone a perspective that's smaller than a large automotive uh, manufacturer, but smaller than one, um, you know, an automotive as, a, as, a, um, as an industry globally is about $4 trillion. So, you know, we, you know, robotics as an industry is close to a hundredth the size of the, the car, you know, automobile industry. So it's a small industry and it, it's been evolving fairly slowly over time. So, it started with industrial automation, which is robots that do just very, very specific tasks. You know, you, we've all seen videos of you know, robots welding in factories and so on. And you know, those have gone from just going from point to point doing welding, say, to things that are now a little bit more broad where there's sensing in the loop and you have cameras and you can actually look at what you're, what you're doing. Um, and the robot changes its behavior based on that. But the the business of robotics is really just starting to mature, I think. It's really getting to this place where it, it's just starting to leverage up. We're getting systems that are more capable. We're getting systems that are more able to deal with um, changes in the environment and environments that are a little bit more flexible. And we're moving toward systems that are autonomous. We're not there yet. Um, you know, so I always, I always start by saying, you know, robotics is small. What robots are actually doing looks like um, you know, Roomba vacuum cleaners, industrial robots, and a few semi-smart machines. You know, we're lucky enough to work with Seb and, and see, you know, robots like that. You know, you and I get to see that. But I think um, 
the uninitiated think that there's a lot more of that going on um, in the world than there really is. And, and the companies like FarmWise are, are an exception and a, and a kind of bright light for where we might go. So I'll start off by saying the business of robotics is small, hard, and um, most of the successful businesses right now look like businesses that are solving a specific problem for a specific customer, um, like FarmWise or like companies that do um, logistics um, and, and delivery in, inside of larger companies. Um, and we're just starting to get to the point where robots can be a little bit more general. Yeah, but I also you know, want to bring attention to one of your insights about what it takes to build a successful robotics company and what kind of a team to put together. Mm -hmm. Interdisciplinary approach. Sure. Um, you know, one of the things that has struck me about robotics, and it, it struck me about a couple of different industries, but it's more so in robotics than any, anywhere else that I've worked is how multidisciplinary a team needs to be to be successful. So a robotic solution is you know, theoretically this automated machine that's doing something useful for the customer and for the planet. Um, and to build that thing, you need mechanical engineers, you know, because there's a machine. Um, you need electrical engineers to get all the motors and controls to work right. You need software engineers to program it. Um, and that just gets you a machine that might do something. And then on top of that, you, you end up also needing um, people who do um, human robot interaction and user experience design. You need people who do um, product work in terms of understanding really where, what the customer need is and how that, how that translates to what the machine needs to do. And at the end of the day, to also build something that's, I think, um, valuable to the end customer and positive to the world, you need lots of different perspectives on how you can solve problems and what the right fit is um, for, for automated solutions. It's, it's really easy to build um, automated solutions that, that uh, feel or are inhumane. Um, it's hard to build automated solutions that actually feel humane, that feel intuitive, that feel right and, and give a positive impact. So, one, uh, robotics is essentially the most multidisciplinary sport I've ever seen. You know, it takes people from all different backgrounds, from all different um, uh, types of knowledge, and from all different cultures, I believe, to actually build something that both works and really um, has the type of positive impact in the world that I think most roboticists dream of when, when we think about making these things. All right. So speaking of the positive impact and adoption, how has COVID-19 impacted that? You know, I'm not aware of any major technological breakthroughs since February, but there's a lot more talk of adoption of deployments and things like that. So what are your thoughts on the, you know, zooming out the wider automation field and, and impact with COVID? Certainly. Um, I think, you know, I'll, I'll start by saying there's, of course, a huge amount of uncertainty about how, how our world's going to change. Um, you know, on what the new normal of the you know, current pandemic and post pandemic. That being said, I think there's also a pretty clear signal that um, many different um, constituencies are, are more excited about leveraging robotics and automation now than they were pre-crisis. And I think, you know, what I'm seeing uh, across the board is people are certainly more open to any technology that um, keeps you know, workers or customers safer. Um, any technology that um, allows things like, uh, like supply chains to keep working um, in the face of the pandemic. And robotics certainly can play a role. Robotics and automation can certainly play a role in, in both of those things. I think it's, people are also more able to embrace it uh, uh, because we've all had to shift our workflows and patterns pretty significantly. And one of, the, one of the hindrances to adoption in robotics and automation is always, how is this gonna change the process? Um, you know, so if you're building a robotics business or introducing a new application, the, you know, the best way, the way I would counsel most people to do it is if you can find some way of doing it, that's a drop-in replacement for something else, a lot of your problems go away because you don't have to figure out how the workflow changes and you don't have to retrain everyone on how the workflow changes. 
So that has in some ways limited um, adoption of robotics and automation in the past. Um, in this new era, we're, we're, it, we're willing to look at different workflows for many, many different things that we do. Um, you know, everything from how we all get food in our houses right now follows a very different workflow than it did than it did four months ago. And I think we see that across the board. And I think that that um, creates an opportunity for a, a, a deeper conversation or a, a, a conversation that's more friendly to the workflow being changed slightly so that automation might play a bigger role. Again, mostly, you know, especially when it can uh, keep people safer, um, you know, especially workers and customers. Well, what about metrics for success or for dis even deciding to deploy robots in some workflow or process, you know, manufacturing, warehouse, wherever you, whatever it is, you know, uh, prior to the pandemic, you know, we looked at pick rates. Well, you know, people do it faster, therefore robots suck. But, you know, has that thinking changed? I, I think it is. I, I think it is changing. And I think, um, you know, one, one example of a, a clear metric that I'm seeing popping up everywhere is, um, if, and, and it's really weird because it's binary, um, is, is the process touchless or not? You know, so in addition to it having to have a certain level of efficiency, it also has to have a certain level of safety. And one of the big metrics of safety now is, is it touchless? How many surfaces are involved? How much air movement is involved? And I, I think we will see this, this, um, this shift to different metrics that revolve much more around uh, safety and contact. And again, I think that'll, that, that represents a, an opportunity for us to build uh, automation solutions that both address problems well and, and keep people safe. Makes sense, yeah. All right, uh, Alan Miller has a question for you as well. Uh, so what do we need to do in order to get to the general purpose platform you envision, back to the cognitive platform for robots? Um, so I, I, I'll, I'll start by saying there's a few my overarching belief, and our overarching belief at Robust AI is that um, we're at a pretty fantastic place in history in that a lot of the pieces of the solution exist. Um, unfortunately, most of those pieces have been used in isolation. You know, we think that a more general platform that's useful for robotics is possible if you combine the best of Many of things that many of the things we've done in the past, and and we believe by combining um, the best parts of deep learning, the best parts of classical AI, the best parts of uh, certain robotics uh, algorithms, you can build a hybrid solution that um, essentially allows the robot to know what's around it, and once that happens, it changes how you program robots, it changes how you describe applications, it makes your applications safer because you know, the robot actually has some idea of what's around it. Um, and we believe it makes those, those, uh, those applications more robust, thus, thus the name of the company. All right, clever name. <laughs> All right, so um, another question, John Slavin, uh, my buddy from former NVIDIA buddy. How important is simulation software in your team's R&D? I think that's a little specific for the call, but I, I would say, um, I'd say across the industry, I think simulation is an, inv an invaluable uh, asset. And I think um, it, it, whether it's automation in terms of factory automation, whether it's uh, uh, you know, more general robotics or whether it's you know, autonomous vehicles, I think simulation has a huge part to play. And it really allows us to try out hundreds or thousands of examples um, for every one that we try in the real world. And I, I think you have to, you have to mix these two things. Um, but you know, for every, you, you have to try things in the real world with real robots, with real objects, but um, simulation does give you a leg up in, in the ability to, to do lots of it virtually also. All right, so one last question. Uh, we are running out of time. Um, I was gonna ask you a lot more questions about the future, short term, medium term, long term, but this kind of gets right to the heart of the matter. Uh, an audience question from Alethea O'Neill. How can I best prepare for, for and welcome our future robot overlords? Um, so I, I think the, the good news is our future robot overlords will first not be that smart. So <laughs> in a way, it'll be like taking care of babies first. Like our current ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll comment, but probably better than that. 
Um, so it'll be like taking care of babies first before they become our overlords. But I think um, most specifically, I think the trend's going to look like um, we're starting to see applications in more in, in environments that have more flexibility. And right now, you know, it's you know, I, I, I urge everyone take a look at your Roomba. That's the state of the art. Um, you know, and and I can joke about that because one of my co-founders is the co-founder of iRobot. So um, Rodney but, Brooks. Rodney Brooks. So we, we can, you know, right now, a lot of what we'll see in the next, I think, five years is just robots that are getting better at what we consider to be normal environments and not making stupid mistakes in environments that we think are, are simple. Um, I think the next phase when robots um, actually have, when there's a lot more perception in the loop, a lot more processing online, and a lot more uh, semantic understanding where the robot really has a, a deeper understanding of the, the world around it and a deeper understanding of the, co the connections between those objects, we'll start seeing some much more interesting uh, behavior and applications and, and have some more interesting uh, uh, interactions. So I think it's, it's uh, unsexy edge cases for the next you know, three to five years um, before we get to um, actually having things that we can interact with that seem, that seem smart in a way that is interesting as opposed to just not stupid. Um, and then I think in, in, the, in the much further future is when we get to the point where um, robots are actually doing things that we consider genuinely smart in whatever alien way that, that you know, they come into to, right. uh, experiencing the world. Well, speaking of Ronnie Brooks, he doesn't think you know, it's going to happen in his lifetime anyway. In most of our lifetimes. This right. is true. Yeah. All right. So we are out of time. Uh, we can bring Seb back uh, and maybe address a few more questions. But you know, in the meantime, uh, I would like to uh, thank both of you for your amazing insights, for participation, and for changing the world for the better. I mean, you are like the ideal playground companies uh, that we aspire to always invest in. Thanks. Thanks, Sasha. Thank you, Sasha. Thanks for having us. A, yeah, it's a deep pleasure. Appreciate it. Yeah, All right. Um, while I'm waiting for audience questions, uh, ah, here we go. What are some of the what are some of the urgent major challenges in terms of market adoption? Who wants to uh, tackle that one? So what's preventing uh, you know deployment basically? Okay, so there's a lot of willingness now because of COVID, but okay, why? How, how, what's blocking? So farming. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to maybe echo uh, something that Anthony said that I think um, really resonate with us, which is you really have to tackle, if you, to maximize ad adoption and adoption speed, you really have to tackle use cases that are a one-to-one -one replacement for something that exists in order to minimize workflow disruption. Um, so I think if we speak broadly, like this is definitely a key indicator, at least for the the world that I'm familiar with, which is uh, farming automation, this is a key thing to, to, to maximize, like really understand well, not only the technical task, but also how that technical task integrates into the workflow. So you take like both the upstream and downstream elements into account when you design the solution. Um, and I think even when you do that, and we've, we've spent, again, like we spent a lot of time doing that, like you still have to solve those operational issues. Like the way we've seen it, like there is no like, there's always some differences. And so you really have to be uh, on top of that one. So I think that's one of the key challenges, um, at least in our industry for fast adoption of technologies is how do you integrate into, into workflows easily? Yeah, Anthony. So I, I, I was gonna say the same thing, but more generally, I think this, the, the fundamental challenge is it's as hard as taking someone who's never done a job before, explaining to them the job that you want to do and all of the things around that job. Now imagine if that, that person that you're explaining it to also isn't a person. They don't understand any of the things a person understands and you essentially have to code that entire solution. So um, really getting to the point where you understand the workflow well enough, you integrate into the workflow appropriately and you have a solution that does that um, in a humane way so that the people around it get from it what they need um, just takes a ton of work. 
And I think the short answer is we're, we're really only going to be able to do that across some number of solutions in the short term. And, you know, they'll look like, uh, you know, Seb's great company, you know, finding some area, really understanding it and really building a, a solution for it. Um, and there's a ton of work for each one. All right. Very last question, because we're five minutes over, so we're going to end after this one, and uh, for Anthony, actually, from Hadi Nahari. Uh, how would you characterize the state of predictive, proactive, preemptive maintenance in the industrial robotics in general? Would you consider this a greenfield opportunity? Um, so I'll, I'll say I'm not, an, I'm not an expert on it. I actually, um, funny enough, backed into it because um, Sasha knows this. I spent a year and a half uh, just studying deep learning and machine learning stuff a while ago. Just you know, I, I do this every once in a while. Just take some time and go really deep on something. Um, so I, I don't I, I don't know if I'd consider it greenfield, but I do think it's a huge opportunity. And I think one of the the general trends is the amount of data that we're getting about machines and processes has uh, really exploded over the last uh, you, know, you know five or more years but our ability to use that data is now catching up with it. We, we have, um, we're starting to have a, a lot of good um, analytics-based algorithms for doing um, you know, things like predictive maintenance. That said, I still think we're pretty early on. You know, I still think for the most part, um, you know, and I ended up uh, doing some consulting to, with a company around this uh, a year and a half ago. For the most part, you know, algorithms that we've known for 20 or 30 years on the data that we have now give pretty good results. But I think similar to everything, um, that's just the beginning. So um, I don't know where it's gonna go. But I think we have kind of all the underpinnings um, for a world in which it won't be surprising that a machine will tell you when a certain part of it needs to be replaced, um, you know, two weeks before and asks you to get it delivered. Um, you know, and, and that's the future I think we're going to, but we're, we're just at the beginning now just-in-time maintenance kind of yeah. thing. All right. Well, unfortunately, we have to end here as engaging as the discussion is. Thank you to again. Thank you to all our audience. Please do come back for future RoboChats. Uh, we promise to make it in as interesting as today and bring in more amazing people. All right. Thank you all for attending. See you next time. Thanks, Thank Sasha. you, Sasha. Bye. Bye. Bye.